You're listening to the True Crime Witch Podcast, the podcast that takes you into everything murderous, mysterious, and downright macabre. I'm your host, Emma, and you're listening to episode 15, The Orange Socks Jane Doe. Before we jump into the episode, I'd like to make a disclaimer that the True Crime Witch Podcast covers topics such as rape, murder, crimes against children, and other sensitive topics. This podcast won't be for everyone, and your listening discretion is advised. I also want to take this time to say thank you to my two latest patrons and official members of the Spooky Gang, um, JT and Rudy from the amazing True Crime Lab podcast. Seriously, if you guys haven't already listened to JT and Rudy, go and listen. They are incredibly hilarious, very well researched, and I have just binged all four episodes that you guys have. Um, me and JT chat on quite a regular basis, you know, we're in the same podcasting circle. So thank you so much for believing in me and supporting the podcast. And you can find that podcast by just searching the True Crime Lab podcast on wherever you get your podcasts. My other new patron is Dodie Miller, who is incredibly my first ever $10 patron, which completely took me by surprise. Uh... I'm kind of speechless because I was just so in shock when I got the email. I actually thought it was like a fraudulent email, you know, one of those spam emails. I was like, nah, this this can't be real. So thank you so, so much, Dodie. And it really means the world that you believe in me and you believe in the podcast and that you want to donate $10 to help make this my full-time thing. So thank you. A badge and a handwritten thank you note is on its way to you now. This is episode 15 of the True Crime Witch podcast, The Orange Socks Jane Doe. This week's episode takes us back to Halloween 1979 in Georgetown, Texas. Halloween is usually a day filled with mischief and magic. However, for The Orange Socks Jane Doe, the day would be marred with tragedy and a mystery that spanned over 40 years. Orange Socks was discovered on October 31st, 1979, in a drainage ditch just off Interstate 35 in Georgetown, Williamson County, Texas. Her cause of death was strangulation and she had extensive bruising on her neck and body. The bruising came from the fact that she had been thrown from an overpass and dragged through a grassy area. She was also completely naked apart from a pair of orange socks which led her to obviously be identified as the Orange Socks Jane Doe. Jane Doe was estimated to have been between 15 and 30 years old, had 10 inch long brown hair with a reddish tint, hazel eyes and weighed between 140 and 160 pounds. Her legs were unshaven, suggesting that she may have been a drifter or homeless in life without access to shaving products. Or it could have been that she just preferred the more hippie modern lifestyle and just preferred not to shave her legs in a protest of sexist attitudes and the sexual revolution of the 1960s and 70s. Jane also had a large number of insect bites. Um, She also had very long toenails, which I find a bizarre fact to be listed down on her profile but I guess if that helps anyone identify her and her fingernails had also been painted. Jane had a hairline scar along her jaw which would aid investigators in the inve- in the identification of Jane. Her earlobes were described as quote unique and her toes were longer than average. Whilst these details may seem like small details, 40 years down the line in 2019 they would lead to the positive identification of our Orange Socks Jane Doe. 
During her post-mortem, it was found that Jane had suffered from sapholangitis, which is an inflammatory infection of the fallopian tubes, which is a direct result of contracting gonorrhea. In life, this would have caused Jane some amount of pain and discomfort. Two of her teeth were missing, but it isn't stated whether this was due to her body being thrown over the overpass or from disease or poor dental care in life. The rest of her teeth were well maintained, but showed little sign of dental work or treatment. This told investigators that whilst Jane did have access to dental treatment in life, she may have been from a working class background or away from a traditional family setting for some time where she would have been able to access that dental care. Another piece of evidence that supported investigators theory that Jane Doe was a nomad or a drifter was the fact that she was using a towel instead of period products, possibly in an attempt to avoid spending her much needed cash. Either that or in that life Jane was unable to afford products and had to do the best with what she could. It's very possible that, you know, if she was a drifter or a nomad or she had been homeless due to circumstances beyond her control, it's possible that, you know, she was just having to make do with what she had or she was finding a different way to spend her money or she just didn't like the period products that were offered in 1979. I'm guessing that they wouldn't, maybe wouldn't have been too comfortable, but it seems that, you know, a towel is a bit of a strange thing for a woman to choose. But again, I guess that's that's your own choice, but it kind of led investigators to theorise that she didn't really have much money or much access to medical and personal care. The main piece of evidence that almost confirmed the drifted theory to police was the fact that Jane was found with two matchbooks one of which was from a hotel in Henrietta, Oklahoma, which is around a 375 mile from Georgetown, Texas, where her body was found. Now, before we get into the investigation and identification section of this episode, I want to lead, to read a list of women who have been officially ruled out as the Orange Sox Jane Doe. I will present their name, their age at the time of their disappearance and location. Kathleen Rogers, 15, went missing from Oroville, California on March 3rd, 1973. She was 15 years old at the time of her disappearance and she's thought to be a runaway. However, it is now suspected that she was in fact murdered. Sharon Pretorius, 13 years old, missing from Dayton, Ohio on September 28, 1973. Sharon was believed to have been abducted before she was murdered. Pinky Davis Heron, 18 years old, missing from Delvale, Texas on January 1, 1974. Pinky was last seen with her friends on New Year's Eve and she has not been seen since. Brenda Davidson, 14 years old, missing from Woodbridge, Virginia on March 4, 1974. Brenda, like Kathleen, is believed to have been a teenage runaway. Laurie Allison Smith, 23 years old, missing from Tucson, Arizona on February 8, 1977. The circumstances around Laurie's disappearance are believed to have been due to a drug trafficking ring. Nancy Jason, 19 years old, missing from Chevy Chase, Maryland on July 20, 1977. Nancy disappeared before a trip to Florida and has never been seen since. Lisa Borden, 19 years old, missing from Lodi, California on October 10, 1979. Lisa went missing after planning to fly out from California back to her hometown in Texas. Lisa was however quickly ruled out as orange socks due to the surgical implants that she had in her hands, as obviously these were not found in Jane Doe and would have been a huge identifying factor and also I believe that this is possibly a modern medical thing but they would have had serial numbers in those implants or some sort of identifying mark that you can match against 
records. I believe that's how it works. I believe that's how like dental implants and stuff like that work. They have like, you know, or I believe maybe even breast implants have, you know, an identifying number that corresponds with each patient. You know, please correct me if I'm wrong. Susan Cook, 30 years old, missing from Clee Ellen, Washington on June 16th, 1984. Now, I know what you're thinking. Susan's date of disappearance is actually listed over five years after the discovery of orange socks. So I'm a little unsure why she was listed as a rule out. However, she has been officially listed as a rule out. So I thought it was important to mention her anyway. Investigators were left stumped with the case of orange socks due to her being found naked apart from the pair of orange socks. They were unable to look into items of clothing that she may have been wearing and where they may have been manufactured or distributed. The one lead that investigators did have, however, was that one of the two matchbooks that was found with Jane Doe, and one of them was from a hotel in Henrietta, Oklahoma, like I had mentioned earlier. They travelled up to the hotel in question, but with even, you know, they didn't even have a first name, ID, cards, anything, they were unable to find her on the hotel registry. This was most likely before the time where you would need to submit a piece of ID before you were able to rent a room. Um, The 1970s, as we know, is synonymous with drifters and hippies hitchhiking their way across the US to find their small slice of paradise. So it's really no surprise that hotels didn't ask for ID. In their small lines of inquiries, investigators soon ran into dead ends with every single lead they had in the terms of Orange Sox's identity and of the identity of her killer. Hope did come in 1982 when serial killer Henry Lee Lucas confessed to the murder of Orange Sox after picking her up in Oklahoma. He claimed that the pair had had consensual sex before the pair of them got into Lucas's car. Now, if you've watched The Confession Killer on Netflix, Orange Socks is mentioned throughout the series and I would highly recommend it. It's a phenomenal series. It's extremely well researched, you know, produced, put together. And they do mention the fact that, I mean, I don't want to spoil it in case any of you out there have never heard of Henry Lee Lucas and and want to watch it. But, you know, he is known for confessing to crimes that he didn't commit. He did confess to Orange Sox. Um, Personally, I'm a little bit swayed on this one. I I don't know whether he did or whether he didn't. He confessed to it, but without hard forensic evidence, I'm kind of not really inclined to say either way. Um, I think my my background, uh, I did a degree in forensic science and criminology, so with my background I'm very much like hardcore evidence I'm like show me the evidence show me the proof show me beyond reasonable doubt that everything you know that this person did it so for me a confession is only the part way there um I'm very much evidence and fact driven but the fact that he confessed to it kind of makes me a little bit mm, don't know but I guess until we have further forensics and or investigative evidence I guess we won't know. So after getting in Lucas's car, um, Henry Lee Lucas asked Orange Sox to have sex with him again to which she said no. In a fit of rage Lucas apparently murdered the young woman before raping her. Now it is unknown the exact location of the supposed crime scene However, Lucas did tell authorities that he drove to Georgetown so he could dump her body. Another important clue from Lucas is that he said Orange Sox had gone by the name Joni or Judy. Now, there is no way of knowing, you know, on the police's part, whether he was lying or if Orange Sox had been using an alias while she was, you know, quote, hitchhiking across the country. Like many of Lucas's confessions, like you'll see if you watch the Netflix documentary, this was later recanted in 1984, after police attempted to get him tried and convicted for the murder. Governor George Bush Jr. commuted his sentence to life in prison 
from the death penalty, as only the murder of Orange Sox carried the death penalty in, you know, all of the many, many, many confessions that he gave to crimes. It was only the murder of Orange Sox that would carry the death penalty. So Governor Bush said, nah, you know what, life in prison. And Luca Lucas later died in Huntsville Prison of heart failure on March 12, 2001. Due to the lack of physical evidence and a recanted confession, if Lucas did in fact murder Orange Sox, then it could very well be a secret that he has taken to his grave. In 2001, a photograph surfaced that bore resemblance to Orange Sox. This was however ruled out by DNA testing. Other people have speculated that Orange Sox was a woman who had gone missing in the 1970s after she was escaping an abusive relationship. Martha Morrison was also a possible match to Orange Sox, however her remains were found in 2015, officially ruling her out from the Orange Sox Jane Doe case. The popular TV show America's Most Wanted even featured Orange Sox's case twice since her tragic death in 1979. Now, this actually led to an anonymous tip where a woman claimed to have seen Orange Sox hitchhiking on the day of her murder. Now, sadly, this hasn't given police or investigators any new information or leads, but it kind of does back up their theory that she was a drifter, a nomad, or the fact that she was just hitchhiking somewhere, you know? There are stories of people who would hitchhike to work because you know, especially living in the UK, I massively underappreciate how big the US is. You know, not everyone has access to transport, not everyone can drive. Um, public transport might not be good in that area, you know. Hitchhiking in the 70s might have been their only way to get from their small town or village into the city for, for work, you know. It could be that, so I guess it does some sort of credence to the fact that they thought she was a drifter but then again we can't discount the fact that maybe she was just going somewhere she could have been going shopping meeting a friend going to work but I feel like that's that's quite an important tip and it's not something that should be overlooked in 2016 on the 37th anniversary of her death NECMEC or the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children released brand new composite sketches of the Orange Sox Jane Doe. It wasn't until 2019 when the Orange Sox Jane Doe case finally had a break. The older sister of a woman, now her name has never been publicly released or not publicly released as of the 13th of December when I'm recording this episode, um, I believe that, you know, the older sister and the rest of the family just want some anonymity and some peace while they get to grieve for their lost family member and perhaps they don't just don't want the attention of the press etc which I can completely understand you know they just want to be kept out of the public as much as possible and deal with their tragic loss in their own way out of the spotlight so the older sister was of a woman named Deborah Jackson and she had contacted the police after seeing the Orange Sox sketches on the news and believing that Orange Sox may possibly have been her missing sister, Deborah. Now, Deborah Jackson was last seen by her family in Abilene, Texas in 1977, where she had left to go and work in Amarillo, Texas. See? Sort of get the hitcher vibe here. Whilst in Amarillo, Deborah worked at the Ramada Inn before going to work in an assisted living centre in Azil or Azel, Azel, A Z L E. I apologise, Texas. Now, after 1979, there were no employment, no social security, no bank, no nothing for Deborah. Her family said that they didn't file a missing persons report because they sort of assumed that she'd just left to go make her own life and that she was doing okay which again you see that quite a lot you see that in the Grateful Doe case or the Jason Callahan case where you know he was just touring following the Grateful Dead around you know his family just thought 
yeah, he's just up to, you know, up to his own thing, doing his own thing, doing what he wants. Um, I believe it was quite a popular thing, you know, especially young people and teenagers coming into their own. You know, I'm going to go strike out on my own, I'm going to do my own thing, I'm going to get a job, get a house, whatever. So I guess it wasn't massively uncommon that people would just leave home one day and maybe never contact their family again if they didn't want to. I can't say that it would be that uncommon. I guess it still happens now, which, I mean, if that's what you want to do, cool. The sister then went with the Williamson Police Department and the DNA Doe Project to provide a DNA sample for comparison and, hopefully, a potential match. The Williamson County Police Department made identification via a comparison of family photos from the Jackson family, along with autopsy and other forensic photos gathered by investigation over 40 years ago. As well as using the unique identifying features of Orange Socks or Deborah Jackson, so she had the scars on her lower legs, which were actually from impetigo scars that Deborah had suffered in childhood, and she also had the similarity with the unusually long toes and the uniquely shaped earlobes. The DNA Doe Project then uploaded the sister's DNA to the genealogy database called GED or GEDmatch, which also had the DNA of Orange Socks on file. Now, here's a quote from um, a representative of the GED match and the DNA Doe Project who liaised and worked on the case. So, quote, by testing the relative with a direct-to-consumer DNA test, her identification was supported by additional DNA matches we already had connections with from gedmatch.com, end quote. The Williamson County Police Department had been working on forensic analysis of Orange Sox evidence ever since April of 2018. They had recently submitted fingernail clippings for further DNA testing in the hopes of identifying male DNA that was found underneath her fingernails. Boom. We got you. On Wednesday the 7th of August at 2pm EST, Williamson County called a public press conference in which law enforcement and members of the DNA Dope Project were present. Williamson County Sheriff Robert Chody revealed that the grave marked as Unidentified Woman 1979 could now be changed to the final resting place of 23-year-old Deborah Jackson who was last seen by her family in Abilene, Texas, in 1977. Thanks to the unwavering hard work of the Williamson County Police Department, the DNA Doe Project, GED Match, and of course everyone else involved, our Jane Doe is no more. She finally has her name back. Deborah's case is proof that we should never ever give up hope even after four decades. The only piece missing in the puzzle of Deborah Jackson is the identity of her killer. Now, I hope for her and for her family that one day I'll get an email, a notification, that another press conference is gonna be held in which we will be finally able to put her case to rest once and for all. If you would like to listen to the whole press conference, I believe it's about 20 minutes long. Um, I've linked it down below for you. Um, you might, If you're in the UK, you're probably going to need a VPN to access it because a lot of US uh, websites, like news websites, I get blocked from. So, you know, use NordVPN or something like that. Shout out NordVPN. Hit me up with that sponsorship. <laughs> I'm joking, but that would be really cool if NordVPN would like, you know, hit me up with a podcast sponsorship and give me a VPN. That would make my life so much easier. Thank you for giving Deborah Jackson a moment of your time. I know that Orange Socks has been covered before, but I wanted to bring the update to her case. She deserves her name and her identity back. After 40 years. May she rest in peace, and may we finally one day catch the piece of shit 
who killed her. And hopefully with the advances in forensic genealogy, GD, Jed Match, I hope that he will be brought to justice. So that was episode 15 of the True Crime Witch podcast, The Orange Socks Jane Doe. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you enjoyed a more positive end to a true crime case. I mean, true crime cases are never positive. They're never going to be positive by nature. But I thought that it was really, really nice that, you know, Deborah finally has reclaimed her name. Her family have some answers of what happened to her, of what became of her. Um, Williamson County Police Department have some answers. You know, the local community have some answers too because I know a lot of people were deeply invested in her case. You know, people would decorate her grave every year. At Christmas, people would leave her flowers. So she was really one of their own. You know, no one ever forgot about her. No one ever gave up on her case. And for that, I want to say thank you to everyone involved. If you would like to get early access to this episode or all my other episodes, plus a little thank you note and some exclusive content from time to time, you can join my Patreon for $3 a month. It's just www.patreon.com slash truecrimewitchpod. Um, My Twitter is just at truecrimewitch. Again, I'm the same on Instagram. I'm kind of rubbish at updating Instagram at the moment. I'm just a very, very busy bee. You know, it's Christmas time. Super busy. Work super busy. Personal life super busy with trying to get everything done for Christmas. But I promise I'll get better updates in Instagram. But if you want the most updates, Twitter's the best way. If there is anything you want to ask me, you know, you want to suggest a case or ask a question, feel free, you can email me, uh, it's just truecrimewitch at outlook.com. I do have Google Forms where I have Q&A questions that I'm going to do a mini episode on at some point, and I do have a like Google Form for submitting a case suggestion, so I'll leave them somewhere for you. Don't forget to rate and review uh, whichever platform you listen to, whether you're on Spotify, Um, just keep listening if you're on iTunes please give me like a little five star rating and a review it really helps my podcast grow it helps me reach out to other people Um, just a rating review a nice little comment don't be a hater though I don't need no keyboard warriors okay I've got enough of those on Twitter and remember friends stay safe and stay spooky